couple of months ago, I woke up and, <clears throat> excuse my nasal uh, allergies, we all have them. I woke up and we were out of coffee. It was bad, Jeff. And I don't know about you, but when I wake up without any coffee in the house, that's the number one, you know, doesn't matter what else is going on. We got to get some coffee going here. So I decided to just drive to the store and buy a cup of coffee. And then I was going to drive to Food Lion and buy coffee for the house. You got to have coffee first and then go buy the coffee, right? So I went to the convenience store at the head of, of Lux Lane and Courthouse. And I had Koa with me. And I don't know what I was thinking. I hadn't had coffee. Yeah. So I can blame it all on that. And so for some reason, and we know why, I left the key in, in the ignition. I just, I was jumping out of the truck, right? Had to get the coffee. And I go in the store, the windows were up because it was a little bit chilly and I didn't want Koa to be cold. And so I come back and Koa is at my window oh, waiting on me. Yes. And he had locked the door. He had locked all of the doors. And guess what? My cell phone was inside charging. Right? But I had my coffee. Right? So that was good. But it was one of those moments where I had to stop and think and problem solve in the moment. What in the world am I going to do? It's six o'clock in the morning. I'm three, four, five miles away from home. And this is bad. I hope you identify. But at that moment, I had not memorized Crystal's phone number because it's in my phone. I'm one of those people. I knew it was 808 something, something, something. You know, and maybe, I don't know. And so I'm asking you to use someone's phone and that felt awkward. I'm drinking my coffee, trying to figure out what in the world I was gonna do. How am I gonna go about the day? I still have stuff, you know. And so I'm asking people, you know, I know this sounds crazy, can you, can you give me a ride home? I'm pointing to the truck, the dog, and you know. But people were going to work, they were busy, I get it, you know, and I felt so vulnerable, like I really didn't know what to do, but just, I needed help. Somebody please help me. And I'll save the details because of who he works for and he's not supposed to actually this person was not actually supposed to do what he did, but he said, I can give you a ride to the end of Lux Lane because I'm not even supposed to drive you that far. They keep up with my miles, they track the miles, but I can drive you that far and drop you off. And I said, that'll work. And so he drove me, not to the end of Lux Lane, but to where it turns into where we live. And so I knew I had a couple of miles left to walk. And I was just so grateful for that and he gave me a ride and, and dropped me off and I still had like a mile and a half in my cup of coffee I was good and I was wearing my sandals right and it was a little chilly wasn't the easiest walk but I had my coffee and I got home and everything was okay but I had not felt that vulnerable in a long time like I, I, I really needed someone to help me just help me and I knew it was going to be someone that I had never met and didn't know. And it really made me think about folks who live that way every day. Every day is a struggle. Every day, many of our sisters and brothers need help. Practical, tangible help. And they're vulnerable. Our sisters and brothers are vulnerable. And I thought a lot about folks in that position. And what life must be like for so many people. 
And I thought about it this week, especially because of this story that we just heard. Can you imagine this man's experience? He had been there for 38 years. 38. Vulnerable. Helpless. He needed someone to help him in a practical, tangible way. He was completely helpless. And Hector, he laid there for 38 years. Why didn't anyone help him? And you have all these religious folks, right? They have, uh, archaeologists have found these kind of pools. They existed. People actually did this. And all these religious leaders that would have been around him, no one stopped to help put him in the pool when the angel stirred the water. Or no one finally said, you know what, man, you've been here a long time. We're going to help you. We're going to get you off the street. Make sure you've got good food. You've got shelter. You've been here long enough, my brother. No one. He's still there. To me, that's one of the most striking parts of the story. No one saw him. No one noticed him until Jesus showed up. And we know that when Jesus shows up, folks who are not noticed, they are noticed. Folks who are not seen are seen, and folks who are not heard are heard. Amen? Amen. Jesus shows up, and he asks the man a question, but I'm wondering if Jesus is asking the man's society this question. I'm wondering if he's, if he's asking the religious leaders, Dave, this question. I'm wondering if he's asking us this question, our society this question. He says, do you want to be made well? I could see him looking at everyone around and saying, this guy's been here for 38 years. Nobody's done anything to help him. Do you want to be made well? Because something ain't right. Amen? Do we want to be made well? And I think the man just didn't know how to answer the question. He's like, well, I've tried. No, 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 no. Do you want to be made well? And Jesus heals him. And we know that when Jesus heals someone, it's not just for the sake of healing. Jesus is reintegrating this person back into society. Or perhaps for the first time, they are a citizen. As I've mentioned before, James Baldwin said what? You're either a citizen or you're not. There are no second class citizens. So this man was now a citizen. Jesus healed to build the beloved community. And we can't lose out on the significance of Jesus' resistance in this story as well. If we read a little further, Jesus did this on the Sabbath. And all these religious folks were watching him, watching this go down and watching the man get up and walk and they see him and his He's, a, he's healed. He's finally a part of community. And they didn't, they didn't say, glory be to God. They didn't say, this is a beautiful thing. It's so good to... No. Who healed you on the Sabbath? Who broke the law? Who broke the rules? Who did this? And if we read in there, they wanted Jesus dead for doing what he did. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. The resistance in this story. Church, we are called. Whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, 
whether we like it or not, to continue noticing those who are not noticed in society, to seeing folks who are not seen in society, who are invisible in society, to giving a voice for those who don't have a voice in society. And sometimes not being seen can be very subtle. Being overlooked can be subtle, yet still be traumatizing to many of our sisters and brothers in society. And we're called, like Jesus, to notice, to see, to hear, to be with, to have compassion, to empower, to build, and to resist, to resist a culture and a society that dismisses, that oppresses, that does not see, does not hear. We're called to resist as Jesus resisted. Richard Rohr, one of my favorite authors and someone we read in our faith formation group recently, he writes in one of his books that he took a trip to Nairobi and he was preaching in Africa and uh, he was at a worship service and I think he said the, the ser- and after preaching they had a, a long time of prayer. They prayed for like an hour. Right? They gathered and prayed for like an hour. And one of the elders prayed this, God, please don't let us move into stone houses. God, please don't let us move into stone houses. And Roar said, he went along and said, yes, Lord, went along with the prayer. But after that, after that prayer time was over and they had gathered outside of the prayer time, Roar asked someone what the elder meant by that. Like, why did he pray that? And the person said, well, as you know, we live in huts. No doors. No barriers, no boundaries, you know. Your family is my family. My family is your family. We're community, we're all family. We're all family. We take care of one another. But when you build a stone house, then you build a door, a wooden door. And on that wooden door, you put a lock. And behind that locked door, you keep your possessions and keep what you own and you keep others out. And then there's the, there's the, that this is mine and this is yours. God, please don't let us live in stone houses. If there's not a symbol of our society, that's it, is it not? We live in stone houses. Church, we are called to follow Jesus, to see those whom society does not see, to hear those who don't have a voice and to give them a voice to notice those who are not noticed, even in subtle ways, to empower those who've been disempowered, and to resist a society that builds stone houses. Because guess what? We're all just children. We're all just beloved children of the living God. Your family is my family. My family is your family. We're all family on this beautiful earth. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good and all the time. Take a good look around, church family.
The peace of God, the peace of Christ, namaste. As the Buddha says, look with, one, look with eyes of compassion upon one another. See the love within each and every one of us. We are family, amen? amen. We are the church. We are called to love one another, to care for one another, to have compassion on one another, to have empathy for one another, to hold one another in prayer, and sometimes hold one another physically. There are times when we need to carry one another physically. Amen. Amen. And to stand together, to resist, to get in some good trouble, to confront the powers that be, the forces of oppression and systematic sins such as racism and homophobia and sexism, and I could keep going. Amen. Amen. To resist it, to oppose it, to stand up against it, and to offer the reign of God in the midst of it. Amen. So receive this church family. May the love of God go with us. May God's love saturate our memories. I want to say that one one more time. May God's love saturate our memories. May God's love overwhelm us. Yes, God, overwhelm us with your love. God is love. As we carry God's love within us, we carry God's love to the world around us. So go forth, church, in the name of the love of God. Amen.